In December 2021, US FDA published a draft guidance on inspection of injectable products for visible particulates. Visible particles in injectable products is a high priority area for FDA due to the potential safety risks. This is also a high compliance risk area for many injectable manufacturers. Today's presentation by Dan and Chris will offer insight into FDA's recommendation that manufacturers develop and implement a holistic risk-based approach to visible particulate control that incorporates product development, manufacturing controls, visual inspection techniques, particulate identification, investigation, and corrective actions designed to assess, correct, and prevent the risk of visible particulate contamination. Hello, and welcome to another session of Pharma Best Practices webinar. Today's session by Dan and Chris is the 115th session since we started this series way back in March 2020. We are very pleased that during this time, more than 150,000 people have accessed our webinars either live or through on-demand access. I appreciate each one of you who have joined here today, and I do hope that you, you're enjoying these webinars as much as we are enjoying hosting these for you. We thank you for your trust and faith in us, and this is what keeps us going. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dan and Chris, today's subject matter expert. Daniel Roberts, Dan, evaluates and assesses pharmaceutical quality system. Dan has over 20 years of government regulatory and pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical industry experience. He was an FDA investigator for eight years, including two years as primary point of contact for conducting pharmaceutical inspections at the FDA India office in New Delhi. Uh, let me now introduce Chris. Christopher Fanelli is a former FDA enforcement lawyer and a partner in Sidley Compliance and Enforcement Group. Chris focuses his practice on compliance with GMP and GLP requirements. So without further ado, it is my honor and pleasure to hand over this virtual platform to Dan and Chris for their presentation. Over to you, Dan. Thank you, Uday, and thank you everyone for joining. It's a pleasure to be able to speak to you today on this very important topic, um, you know, a topic that we work with a number of, of international pharmaceutical companies, including a number of Indian pharmaceutical companies on extremely closely, and that is you know, visual, the inspection of injectable products for vis visible particles. Um, you know, so as Uday said, my name is Chris Finelli. I'm a partner um, in Sidley Austin's uh, FDA enforcement and compliance practice in Washington, D.C. I started my career at FDA in the Office of Chief Counsel, um, where I led a number of enforcement activities, uh, including consent decrees, um, injunctions, um, seizures, warning letters, import alerts, um, with a focus on um, drug good manufacturing practice compliance and, and device um, quality systems regulation compliance. I've been in private practice now for about eight years. Um, and in private practice, I, I focus my practice still on FDA enforcement and compliance matters um, with a specific focus in, in GMP compliance. Um, as Uday said, GLP compliance and compliance with FDA's good clinical practice regulations. You know, I spend a lot of my time, um, particularly pre-pandemic, um, at pharmaceutical manufacturing sites around the world, assisting with responses to um, FDA 483s, responses to warning letters, navigating difficult investigations, um, particularly in the areas of, of particles in injectable products, sterility failures, OOSs, um, and help provide strategic guidance to manufacturers on FDA engagement, um, strategies for engaging European health authorities, um, and strategies for engaging um, health authorities throughout Asia as well, including in China and, and in Japan. Um, so thank you all again for your, for your time today, and we look forward to this exciting webinar and this exciting topic. Um, and with that, I'll allow Dan to introduce himself. All right, thanks, Chris. So my name is uh, Daniel Roberts. Um, this is my second webinar with ISB India affiliate. 
So um, it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Um, so just a little bit about my, my background is I, I used to work at FDA as a FDA investigator, uh, primarily doing pharmaceutical inspections, um, Finnish dosage, API. Um, you know, I spent some time in India um, doing uh, inspections over there. Um, and Andres, it, it was just a real pleasure to be here with you and I'm happy to talk about uh, this important topic. So I'll hand it over to Chris. All right, thanks, Dan. We can move to the next slide, please. Okay. All right, thanks, Dan. So as you can see from um, the agenda slide, so here's what we intend on covering today. Um, right, so, so the first topic, which is, you know, why, you know, why most of you are, are tuning in today um, is, you know, what what are the consequences of 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 you know what is FDA's enforcement activity in this area and what are the consequences of non-compliance from from a GMP perspective, particularly in light of FDA's issuance of the recent regulate or recent guidance document uh, on inspection of injectable products for visible particles, right? Um, so what do we see from a statutory and regulatory background perspective? What is FDA's statutory authority in this area? And what types of um, enf enforcement actions have we seen FDA take recently on um, for for um, deviations or for failures relating to, to particles in injectable products? And then we'll get into a, a more detailed discussion of the December 2021 visu visu visual particles guidance. Um, what are some of the key themes that we see um, in that guidance and some of the key touch points or key lookouts for manufacturers of injectable products. And you know, as you can see here, some of those key themes are you know, assessments of clinical risk, uh, quality risk assessment of, of injectable products, and the visual inspection program considerations. So what, what, do we, what do we see as being the key considerations for the manufacturers of, visual, of injectable products um, as they stand up or as they assess their visual inspection program? Um, you know, then we'll get into some of the key takeaways for manufacturers, things that manufacturers should be thinking about um, in light of FDA's recent guidance document, and also some of the ways in which this guidance document is, is differs from some of the pre-existing guidance um, and technical documents out there, such as the PDA technical document. There are some important ways in which this, this guidance document differs from those from the existing body of literature, and it's important for manufacturers to understand what those key differences are, because certainly those are areas that we anticipate FDA focusing on um, when they come back out and start doing inspections more in a, in a more kind of pre-pandemic basis. Um, you know, we're already seeing a number of inspections in India, um, including inspections on incredibly short notice, and so you know the time to prepare is now, so to speak. And then we'll leave some time for Q and A. Um, so we anticipate that that a number of folks um, who were able to join us today will have some questions. Um, my understanding is that there is a, a question box to to put your questions into, and then we'll take some time um, at the end of the webinar, at the end of our presentation, to go over those questions um, and to try to provide some insight and some answers to some of the key questions that that we see coming up um, throughout the course of today's webinar. Okay. So we'll start today by discussing FDA enforcement um, relating to visible particles in injectable products. Okay. So to get us started, um, you know, as as the lawyer, um, it is always helpful to kind of ground ourselves in the statutory and regulatory background. So what do we need to know from a statutory perspective to understand? what FDA's you know, potential enforcement activities are and what some of the consequences are for failing to comply with FDA's you know, GMP regulations as they relate to the establishment and maintenance of a uh, visual inspection program and including FDA's recent guidance document, you know, the December 2021 guidance document around um, the establishment and maintenance of um, visual inspection programs for injectable products. So FDA enforcement starts with the prohibited acts um, and the act itself, the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act um, identifies numerous prohibited acts relating to drugs. And those are set forth in 21 USC uh, section 331. And those include things 
like the adulteration of, of drugs, the misbranding of drugs, um, the introduction into interstate commerce of an unapproved new drug. So those are the types of things that are prohibited um, under the act and are the kind of the cornerstone of FDA's enforcement um, authority. And so the, the doing or causing of one of the prohibited acts is what triggers a federal civil or criminal case under the FDCA, under the Federal Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act, right? And the important thing here is that it doesn't just have to be a federal civil or criminal case, right? You know, there are um, levels of FDA enforcement action that, that many of the folks on this webinar are familiar with. And it starts, you know, very simply with the issuance of a form FDA 483. Right, FDA conducts an inspection, and at the conclusion of an inspection, they issue a 483 that contains a list of their significant observations from the inspection. At the most basic level, that is an enforcement action taken by FDA in that they've identified potential observations and they've issued, they've put the company on notice of those potential observations and requested that they address them. You know, from there, there is a potential for escalation depending on the significance of, of, the, of the prohibited acts, right? It, what, you know, depending on the significance of the, of the GMP violations observed during the inspection. Those can range from a regulatory meeting to a, um, a warning letter to um, import alert. And then they can, you know, further escalate to things like a civil or criminal case under the FDCA. So those are things that are brought in the court system um, and, and can result in, in significant, you know, can result in the, you know, the permanent shutdown of a manufacturing facility or the levying um, by, the, by the US government of significant monetary penalties um, for violations of the act and for the committing of, of, prohibited, of prohibited, prohibited acts. So importantly, all of these actions, all of these enforcement actions, oh, can you go back, Dan, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so importantly, all of these um, enforcement actions are based on an underlying finding that a drug is adulterated, misbranded, or unapproved. And FDA reaches those determinations as to whether a drug is adulterated, misbranded, or unapproved based on evidence collected during inspection. Um, so for example, evidence collected regarding the, the strength of, of a manufacturer's visual inspection program for its injectable products. Um, and, and importantly, um, even more importantly, the FDA enforcement is, a strict, is based on strict liability. Right? FDA does not need to prove that a manufacturer intended to commit a prohibited act. All that FDA needs to prove is that a pro prohibited act was performed or was, was done, um, and that is sufficient to support a finding that the products manufactured at that facility are adulterated or misbranded or unapproved, and therefore um, enforcement action can be taken to prevent the further committing of those prohibited acts. So that's a really important requirement to keep in the back of your mind as you're thinking about establishing, you know, as, you're, as you think about it, compliance with GMP and in the context of this, of this presentation, the establishment of a visual inspection program for injectable products is that FDA doesn't need to prove that you intended to act badly or, or that you intended to adulterate a drug, merely that the drug is adulterated, for example, by virtue of, of non-compliance with GMP. All right. Okay. So for the purposes of, of today's presentation, um, you know, the prohibited act with, that we are kind of most concerned with from an FDA enforcement perspective is the adulteration of drugs. Um, and that's because FDA, you know, the, the, under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, a drug is deemed adulterated, which means it is determined by, by law to be adulterated if it is not manufactured in compliance with, could, with current good manufacturing practice. All right, and that is really important for us to keep in mind as we think about both GMP, broadly speaking, and you know, the visual inspection of, of injectable products and a kind of more narrow focus for the purposes of, of today's presentation. And this is set forth, and in, in, as you can see in the citation here in 21 USC section 351A to B. So this is important because it means from an FDA perspective that GMP is the law 
and, and the failure to comply with GMP can result in, in legal consequences, um, right? And those can include enforcement action, a regulatory enforcement action, such as a warning letter or import alert, or, or judicial enforcement action, such as a seizure or injunction, or even criminal, you know, criminal prosecution under the FDCA. So importantly, um, in terms of you know, how this relates to GMP and the topic at hand today is compliance with visual inspection specifications does not equal compliance with GMP, right? Um, and this is an important, this is kind of a theme that we've seen throughout um, you know, FDA's enforcement and compliance activity, right? Compliance with the specification alone is not sufficient to assure compliance with GMP. Right, compliance with good manufacturing practices is how you assure compliance with GMP. You cannot test quality into a product from FDA's perspective. And compliance with visual inspection specifications is essentially you know, testing a product into compliance. It's really about assuring throughout the entire lot of product life cycle, um, as Dan will discuss, that you've established appropriate controls and specifications and in-process controls to assure that the finished product is essentially free of, of visible particles. Another way in which adulteration comes up in, in this context is under insanitary conditions. Right? If a drug has been prepared, packed, or held under insanitary conditions, whereby it may, be, may have been inter, rendered injurious to health, um, that is another way in which a product can be deemed to be adulterated under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And this is particularly, um, you know, this is relevant in terms of, of visible particles because oftentimes, um, you know, if there are particles in the finished product, FDA questions the conditions under which that product was, was packed, prepared, or held, um, and whether those conditions are insanitary. Um, and certainly, um, you know, we have seen FDA take very aggressive enforcement action in areas where drugs have been packed or you know, prepared or held under insanitary conditions. And finally, a drug is adulterated under the act if it is um, of inferior strength, purity, or quality. Um, and, and that comes into play particularly from a, a quality or purity perspective when we think about visible particles um, because both they both impact the, the quality potentially of the finished product um, and also potentially the purity of the finished product. So these are you know, the number of ways in which a drug can be found to be adulterated under the act um, in the context of, of visible particles. So in terms of some additional regulatory background, so it's not just all about the statute when we talk about um, visible particles, um, especially when we talk about visible particles, because there is sufficient um, you know, other regulatory background in this area, particularly from, from the USP, um, United States Pharmacopeia, and, and from PDA, the Parenteral Drug Association, have issued you know, a, a substantial amount of, of, of guidance and, and, and kind of clarity around uh, visual inspection programs um, for, for visible, or in, inspection programs for visible particles. You know, the first of which is, is USP General Chapter 1, which is the, the chapter on injectable products, right? The, that chapter clarifies or states that inspection processes should be designed and qualified to ensure that every lot is essentially free from visible particles, right? And so that's the kind of the basis of the most fundamental aspect of, of, the, of these inspection programs is compliance with this requirement that every lot is essentially free from visible particles. Um, USP General Chapter 1 also provides that each final container must be inspected, you know, a 100% inspection using a qualified method to detect particles within the visible size range, and all units that are found to contain visible particles must be rejected. Right? So the importance here is that manufacturers should be using a qualified method um, for visual inspection, and that's something that Dan will discuss in detail um, a little later on in the presentation. In addition to USP General Chapter 1, um, there are, there's USP General Chapter 7, um, 790 and 1790, both of which provides additional guidance on, on inspection programs for, for visible particles. In addition to these USP chapters, which provide you know, really useful guidance on, on the establishment of, of inspection programs for visible particles and even in, in some cases, subvisible particles, um, 
there is the uh, PDA document from, from 2015, which provides um, some really helpful insight into you know, what, what industry can be doing um, for, to establish uh, visual inspection programs or inspection programs for visible particles. And this is kind of, this document is the kind of the seminal document that most manufacturers in the US use as the backbone of their visual inspection programs. Um, although, as we'll discuss today, there are some important differences between, between FDA's guidance document and, and some of the requirements and, and, and some of the provisions contained in FDA's guidance document and the information contained or the requirements and recommendations contained in this PDA technical document and in the USP. So in addition to the statutory and regulatory um, kind of background that we just discussed, you know, it's important to have some additional background and grounding in, in kind of visible particles and how challenging it can be to, to both establish an effective visible particle detection system um, through visual inspection um, and how much of this, how widespread this issue is across industry. Right, so, so the standard um, from a regulatory and legal perspective is that sterile drug products must be essentially free of visible particles. But compliance with this regulatory expectation has posed a challenge to industry and has resulted in numerous product recalls, enforcement actions, and supply chain disruptions. So by way of one example, which is stated here and which is also referenced in the PDA document, by one measure, particle-related issues led to 22% of drug product recalls for injectable products between 2018 and 2012. And certainly, you know, there have been you know, improvements in that number over time. But if you, if you look at FDA's recall dashboard, you'll see that uh, injectable, that particles still result, are still the, the, the primary cause of, an, of a significant number of injectable product recalls to this date. Um, and, and this continues to be an issue that persists within industry and is certainly something that we're going, that we expect FDA to continue to focus on as they resume on-site inspections um, following you know, kind of the, the closeout, so to speak, of, of, the, of the pandemic. Um, this is definitely an area we anticipate FDA focusing on um, in, the, in, the, in the coming months and years. Okay, and so as you know, as I just mentioned, evaluating manufacturers' particulate matter control programs is a high priority for FDA and for many FDA investigators. Right, this is an area that is um, that there are easy observations to be made, so to speak. You know, many many manufacturers have either not not fully established particulate matter control programs. Or have only, um, or have not established particulate matter control programs at all, um, right? This is a true measure of of the maturity of a manufacturing site and the maturity of a of a quality system, um, whether the the manufacturer has a robust particulate matter control program, um, and you know, as as Dan will discuss in in a few moments, um, right? Uh, it's not a, just about Visible, visual inspection programs, right? Particulate matter controls are much broader than that and run throughout the product life cycle. And certainly, you know, we anticipate FDA investigators focusing on how companies are establishing these life cycle management approaches to visible particles um, to ensure that the finished product and the product that gets distributed to the US market um, is, is free, essentially free from visible particles. And, and you know these have resulted in numerous FDA enforcement actions um, for for failing to ensure that finished products are essentially free of visible particles. So I'd like to spend uh, a few minutes now, kind of just walking through what we've seen as some of the you know some of the more public FDA enforcement actions over the last few years. Um, relating to to the establishment or the failure to establish robust um, controls for for visible particles. So most recently, in in August 2021, FDA issued a warning letter to Toyobo Co. 
um, Limited, which is a, a Japanese drug product manufacturer. Um, and this, this warning letter is notable for, for several reasons. You know, first, this inspection occurred in, um, in February 2021, which I'm, I'm sure most folks on today's, today's webinar can appreciate was at the height of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, when things were kind of at their worst, um, you know, FDA was in Japan um, to conduct an inspection of this finished of this injectable product manufacturer based on you know signals they were seeing from an from a particles perspective. And so, as a result of this inspection, you know, FDA found significant particulate contamination defects, um, and also found that the company had failed to differentiate. Um, intrinsic particles from extrinsic particles. And, and as we'll discuss, that differentiation and the characterization of a particle as intrinsic or extrinsic is extremely important from a risk perspective and therefore extremely important from an FDA, an FDA GMP perspective is to have, to have those categories extremely clearly defined and the failure to do so can result in, in FDA enforcement action. And then in October, 2020, FDA issued a, a warning letter to Shilpa Medicare Limited. Um, and this warning letter is important because it highlights that, you know, there are many ways in which a manufacturer become, become, can become, be made aware of visible particle contamination um, in its drug products, right? One way is through the visual inspection program. You know, when companies are performing the visual inspection of their filled products, they can detect particles and they can, you know, trigger an investigation through those through those visual inspections. But in many cases, you know, vials or syringes or uh, you know products are distributed containing particles that are not detected during the visual inspection step prior to release. Um, and so it is often the case that manufacturers receive complaints um, from consumers for particles in their finished drug product. And it is extremely important for manufacturers to have, you know, requirements in place and structures in place to receive those complaints and to thoroughly investigate them to determine what the, what the source, the potential source uh, of the particulate contamination is and to initiate investigations to document the root cause and to perform a risk assessment. The, you know, and the failure to handle complaints appropriately is certainly one, something that we see a number of manufacturers struggle with and something that we have supported a number of manufacturers with um, and is something that can definitely result and has resulted in, in numerous FDA enforcement actions. Okay. A little, um, a little less recently, in June 2020, FDA issued a warning letter to Takeda uh, Pharmaceutical Company Limited um, for, uh, to their um, Hikari Japan uh, finished drug manufacturing site. And here, um, the ba one of the basis for the warning letter was the presence of, of black particles um, in their injectable drug products. And this warning letter is notable because it, it kind of you know, reveal some insight into how FDA thinks about um, investigations for injectable products or for visual, for, for particles, for visible particles and in injectable products. And, and one of those things is equipment malfunctions, right? You know, we see time and time again that manufacturers identify equipment malfunctions or specific pieces of equipment as the source of, of visible particles. Um, and it's very important in these instances that manufacturers conduct a thorough root cause investigation um, because they both need to identify the source of the particles, but also identify the potential scope of impacted batches, right? And for an equipment malfunction, the potential scope of impacted batches can be significant. It can be different products. It can be over a significant period of time. And so those are all things that investigators need to, or that, that manufacturers need to make sure they factor into their root cause investigations and risk assessments um, when, when they receive, uh, when they initiate a, an investigation or deviation for the presence of visible particles. In January, a little less recently in January 2020, in January um, 2017, um, FDA issued a warning letter to Porton Biopharma Limited, which was an um, um, injectable product manufacturer based in England. 
Um, and there, um, you know, the first observation, the first warning letter observation related to the company's visual inspection program um, and the presence of, of visual uh, particles in its finished drug product. And so there, the uh, FDA cited the the company for both the continuing presence of visible particles, right? So the ineffectiveness of kappas, right? Because if if the if the, if the visible particle continues to be present in the drug product to FDA, that's an indication that the kappa is initiated to address the presence of that drug product or of the of that um, of that visible particle are ineffective. Um, and also cited the company for the failure to establish appropriate action limits for defect categories, um, right? And so as, as Dan will discuss, you know, FDA's guidance um, on visible particles is extremely clear on the establishment of, of defect categories. So the types of, of visible defect, um, but also establishing action limits for, for those defect categories based on, on risk and, um, and criticality, okay? And then lastly, in, in January 2018, FDA issued a warning letter to, to Celtrion, um, to uh, you know, this Korean-based uh, or Korea-based uh, injectable product manufacturer, um, right? And here, FDA cited the company, um, among other things, for failing to thoroughly investigate visible particles in its finished drug product. And that included um, the failure to extend the investigation to cover all potentially impacted batches Right, again, this is a theme that we see throughout these investigations or throughout these warning letters is ensuring that, that, the, that the scope of the investigation reflects the potential source of contamination and the potential source of or extent of contamination throughout um, you know, batches and products. Um, and also you know, making sure and also cited the company for, um, for not thoroughly or sufficiently addressing or investigating the potential effect on patients of the presence um, of visible particles in the injectable products. All right, next slide. All right, and with that, I will, I will turn it over to Dan. Um, so thank you all again for your time and, and Dan, over to you. Okay. Great, thanks, thanks Chris, I appreciate that. Um, so let me go ahead and start this here. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah. So so thank you again for having me here today. So so I, I just wanted to kind of the purpose of this um, discussion today is to kind of go over the the main topics. So so very high level overview of uh, FDA's you know recent uh, guidance document on visible particles. So those. Um, we we're talking about earlier in December. There was a um, there's a guidance document that FDA released, and so I just want to kind of go over some of the main topics and some some of the ways that this new guidance document kind of differs from um, or how they're, they're similar, but also differs from the the PDA document um, regarding um, industry perspective on particles. Okay. Um, so first off, you know, um, Chris uh, discussed some some situations earlier where you know where visible particles, uh, injectable products can cause uh, jeopardy of patient safety. So, um, you know, so FDA, you know, is is looking for manufacturers to develop you know holistic uh, risk based approach to visible particle controls. So um, so it's kind of like more. You know, it's starting from the product development, and then all the way through, um, you know, commercialization and more more of like a life cycle approach to develop um, to have a uh, a control strategy for particles. Uh, you know, traditionally, um, you know, pharma companies would create these uh, particle libraries based on particles that have been observed and investigated. Uh, through commercial production, but this um, this FDA guidance kind of pushes that um, that further back into more of the product development stage. You know, predicting based on knowledge of your process, your manufacturing process. Um, you know, what types of particles may be present in in your product um, instead of waiting until 
commercialization and then determining uh, what particles are are, are there. Um, so so it's more of a preventative um, measure versus a uh, versus a reactive measure, which is uh, historically uh, what you've seen as as far as visual inspection and, and particle um, at pharma companies. So again, the the guidance document talks about you know identifying those things during product development, you know implementing manufacturing controls. Um, it discusses a bit about visual inspection techniques, particularly um, the use of automated technologies for visual inspection for performing visual inspection. Um, it talks about particular identification, uh, you know, how, how to conduct the investigation. And Chris provided some um, reference to some warning letters that were previously issued where um, the investigation wasn't, um, you know, thorough enough. It didn't evaluate other batches. It didn't evaluate the manufacturing process and, and scope. Basically, the scope of the investigation was not, um, it was very limited. So they're, they're looking, you know, they, they encourage companies to, you know, expand the scope of these investigations into particles to include other products, other areas, and things like that. And and, and also, you know, developing proper corrective actions. So, um, you know, one of the references to one of the warning letters earlier was talking about, you know, the consistent, you know, you know, getting particles in your products, but then not doing anything about it. So, you know, the idea is that if you know if that there's particles being generated, you should have some, you know, short-term, medium-term, and long-term kind of corrective actions to address those um, those uh, those concerns. You know, that and that may be, you know, looking at it more from a um, you know, updating equipment, you know, maybe uh, implement, you know, removing people from the process or, you know, you know, there's, there's several different corrective actions that can be implemented to address particles. But the idea is that, um, you know, you should be moving forward to create some type of mitigation strategy to reduce the amount of particles in your product and not just accept it as the way it is. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, and again, it's it's more of you know the emphasis is more of on a preventative measure versus a reactive measure. Um, so that that's kind of how the FDA um, is, is seeing visible particles going forward. Um, but it's important to note that this guidance document is limited to visible particulate control. So it's it's not. Um, it, it doesn't discuss anything about uh, visible or some sorry sub visible particle. Um, so sub visible particles are kind of and, and physical defects are out the, outside the scope of this um, this uh, visible uh, particle inspection guidance. So it's basically just it's specific for just visible uh, particles. Um, and then the the guidance is basically you know, it, it falls under three different categories. Um, so, you know, it, it talks about the clinical risk of visible particles, um, quality, you know, performing risk assessments associated with these uh, particles and, um, and some ideas to consider for visual inspection programs. Um, it's important to note that these, uh, that this guidance document aligns very closely with that PDA a technical report um, that, that was issued in, uh, I believe it was like 2015, um, you know, and, and it uses similar terms um, such as like inherent, intrinsic, and extrinsic to, to define kind of the source of the particles. So, so just real generally, you know, inherent would be something that would be uh, part of the formulation itself. So if there's particles that are um, generated you know, as a result of the formulation, then that would be something that's, you know, inherent to the product itself. Um, and then you have other things that are like intrinsic. So, you know, in this new FDA guidance document, they more, they narrowly define what the definition of intrinsic is to include um, just the immediate container clo closure system. So that would include the, um, the vials, the, uh, the stopper, you know things that are in immediate contact with the with the drug product itself. Um, you know, 
I think Chris provided some examples of warning letters that were previously issued where the definition of intrinsic was was uh, more widely used to describe uh, manufacturing equipment. So, for for example, this is more of an egregious example, but you know, um, uh, you know, paint chips or something like that would not be considered, uh, you know, an, an intrinsic particle, right? Because that's um, you know outside of the immediate container closure system, but, you know, um, and then the last uh, category is, is extrinsic. So that would be anything that uh, that's outside of, you know, outside of the immediate container closure system. So that would be, you know, the example I just provided with, you know, if there was paint chips or something like that, or uh, oil from the <clears throat> machines or, um, you know, I, I don't know, a, a bird feather or something like that. Uh, but you know, anything that's extrinsic to the to the container closure system would be something that would be defined as extrinsic. So it's, it's important to know that on a risk uh, classification level, you know, it goes from a, a lower risk ones of things being inherent, which would be part of the formulation, like a medium risk thing would be something that would be intrinsic and extrinsic would be something that would be of, of highest risk um, to, to patient safety. Um, and the reason being, I mean, we're, we're talking about sterile injectables. So something that's extrinsic to the process has an unknown um, unknown source and an unknown uh, kind of bio burden too. Uh, so, you know, that's, you know, there's a lot of unknowns with things that are extrinsic. So it's so, a it's, that's what kind of raises the classification of it um, as being as being a higher risk. Um, so, you know, as I was saying, the, the this guidance document aligns closely with the PDA document, but it provides some clarification regarding uh, the definition of what's considered, um, you know, it, uh, intrinsic, right? So, you know, when we're talking about the clinical risk of visible particles, you know, it, it depends on the route of administration. Um, so is it intramuscular? Is it something that goes in, is it an IV, you know? You know it, so th these things are kind of taken into consideration as far as looking at the clinical risk for visible particles. Um, you can look at the patient population. Um, you know, is the population of the patients is it, are they at a higher risk for uh, for uh, visible particles being in the product, um, and then th the nature class of the particles themselves. So you know, looking at the physical size or shape, the quantity, uh, chemical reactivity to certain uh, cells or tissues, immunogenicity, um, you know, carcinogenicity. Um, so you know these are just some of the clinical risks to kind of take into consideration um, when we're, we're discussing visible particles. Um, you know, and so the the clinical risks are, are somewhat product specific. So you know you don't it's difficult to come up with a just a real general uh, thought of you know if if there's uh, if there's a certain type of particle you know, broadly using that definition to um, to apply to all products and all formulations because there's different, um, you know, you have a different patient population, you have a different route of administration and um, and the nature or class of the particles. So like size and shape and stuff can be different. So you really have to take it on a case by case basis on on on, on the impact of particles, right? Um, so that's why it's really important that these these investigations are thorough, and um, you know look at all of these uh, possible, um, you, you know taking a risk based approach to 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 identify the the, the overall patient risk, right? Um, so when you're looking at, <clears throat> so manufacturers should consider these clinical risk factors when developing their quality targets and uh, product profile. And establishing, you know, control strategies and things for visible particles. So, um, you know, looking at the formulation, looking at the route administration, patient population, um, 
and all of these things are should be considered as far as evaluating the overall risk of, of the presence of particles. Um, the, the the thing is like you know USP defines things as free of essentially essentially free of particles, right? So sometimes it's difficult for manufacturers to um, there's for like sterile injectables um, to comply with essentially free of particles because there there may be particles generated during the manufacturing process, be it glass or um, you know some type of uh, stoppers or or you know there's there's always some type of particles that are generated during the manufacturing process because things are moving around and um, particles are being generated and they're I, mean, I, I think manufacturers do you know you're you're monitoring the non-viable particulates and stuff during the manufacturing process but um but essentially free you know sometimes it's difficult for manufacturers to meet that criteria so you know, taking a more risk-based approach to it is, is uh, make, makes a lot of sense. Um, so again, you know, I was talking about earlier is, is this risk management approach should be taken during product development. So earlier on uh, in the, you know, prior to commercialization, you know, you should be starting, starting to look at some of the, you know, um, some of the, the possibilities of generating uh, particles during the manufacturing process. So, so for example, like during product development, you know, th there should be some uh, proactive approach to identify uh, typical visible particles that may be present during the manufacturing process, and characterizing these particles, um, and then determining the risk for the particles, uh, providing you know a visual description of, of possible particles. For, for training purposes and uh, for for people that are performing the visual inspection. So um, as I was talking about earlier, you know, uh, traditionally, uh, you know, when looking at visible particles, a lot of times these libraries are created after commercialization. You know, once we find a, so once a, a, a company finds particles in their product, they'll include those onto the library, but that the burden of identifying those particles is, is being pushed further back into product development so you know I, I wouldn't be surprised to see you know more applications uh, you, you know when, during the review cycle them asking about you know the review division asking about um, you know identification of particles and things like that you know earlier on in the product development stage um, again this this goes back to you know more of a preventative approach and being proactive early on and then identifying the risks and then Developing some uh, corrective actions to to address those. Um, so, so for example, like let's say during the product development stage, you identify a certain stage of manufacturing that might be generating more particles than um, th than than it should be. You know, then you know you should implement early on before commercialization um, some some corrective measures to to address those uh, particles being generated. You know whether that's um, changing the speed of the line or you know changing the design of the equipment or things like that but you know just just so you know it, it's more of like looking at it for more from like a process knowledge um, and, and addressing that um, you know being being proactive on that. Um, so again you know manufacturers should consider the potential sources of particulates um, you know you should have analytical methods to uh, monitor them and mitigation strategies to prevent their presence in the final product. So, um, so again, you know, identifying the source, you know, being able to detect them and knowing that there's a possibility of them being there, you know, trying to do something about that to prevent or uh, minimize the amount of those particles being present in the final product is, is kind of the, the overall theme of this uh, FDA uh, guidance that was issued. And again, you know, it's more focused on preventative measures versus reactive measures, which historically, uh, when we're talking about particles, things have been done more of as, as reactionary. So, um, so you know, you know, being being more preventative, I think, is is kind of the overall theme of this. So, um, I talked about this earlier. Um, you know, so the FDA guidance document is consistent with the PDA. 
uh, report. So it defines particles under three different categories. Um, inherent particles, again, that's something that would be part of the formulation itself. Uh, intrinsic particles would be something that is part of the container closure system. And extrinsic particles, it's something that's external from that, uh, from the container closure system. So um, as I was saying before, you know, um, prior to the issuance of this guidance document, sometimes companies were more broadly defining intrinsic particles to include things that should have been defined as extrinsic particles. So looking at it from a risk uh, perspective on, um, you know, looking at microbial risk, you know, things that are inherent particles would be a lower risk, things that are intrinsic particles would be medium, and things that are um, extrinsic uh, would be of, of a high, higher or highest risk uh, category as far as classifying these uh, particles. Um, so, you know, this FDA guidance kind of more narrowly defines intrinsic particles to include just the container closure system, um, not the manufacturing equipment itself. That would be something that would be considered extrinsic and, and would be of higher risk. Um, so manufacturers risk assessment should classify as particles into these three categories and take appropriate actions to address the risk for each category. So I kind of went through those ones. You know, there's different um, level of risk based on these three different categories, extrinsic being the most, the highest risk category for, um, for generation of particles. Uh, you know, this this just kind of further defines what inherent particles. So they're associated with uh, with their product formulation. Um, there's liposomes, um, and part of the quality um, target profile. So so these are like things that are inherent of the formulation itself. That sometimes sometimes particles are generated um, th through the formulation itself. Um, so, you know, you should have limits established for those, uh, and they should be tested, you know, and, and there should be, um, your analytical method should be able to detect these inherent particles, and there should be limits established for those um, particles. Um, sometimes stability testing, um, you know, when products are put on stability, you know, these inherent particles may increase in, in number and size. So. Um, you should have approved uh, acceptance criteria to account for that. Um, so sometimes there's supplemental testing methods that may be used to detect visible particles. So, you know, hard to inspect products, you know, things that are amber vials or things that are, um, uh, you know, a lyophilized product, you know, if there's some type of cake or something of suspensions, emulsions, I mean, those, these are historically, I mean, they're, they're just difficult to perform visual inspection on these, these, these type of products. So, um, so in the guidance, you know, there's, they're talking about using other techniques such as um, uh, x-ray uh, to, to kind of detect these, uh, these part uh, particulates for, for products that are uh, may be difficult to um, visually inspect, you know, m done by ma manual visual inspection. Um, you know, and so the, the, in this guidance document, they're also saying that, um, you know, as I was talking about before, intrinsic particles are, are, are just a lower risk. I mean, when you're looking at it from, um, from, from a microbial perspective, you know, it's, um, you know, intrinsic particles are, are more known, you know, the, the micro, um, versus like extrinsic particles, things that are, that are kind of coming from the environment. So, so things that are coming from the environment, extrinsic particles um, ha have, have a higher risk profile associated with those. Um, intrinsic particles, so I, this just kind of further defines what intrinsic particles are. So they can be related to the manufacturing process and could come from components, containers, and closures, so glass vials, rubber stoppers, or product contact processing equipment, right? 
Um, so what what it what an intrinsic particle is not is is uh, you know something coming from the environment. So like you know if there is a an unknown um, oil or if there's some type of unknown uh, uh, um, you know a paint chip or something like that like that that's not that that's not an intrinsic particle because we're, we, again we're just talking about product contact uh, surfaces um, you know and and the, the manufacturers to control these particles generated um, you know throughout the manufacturing process so so both identifying possibility of, of of these particles being generated but also like you know knowing what those where those sources are you know trying to come up with a strategy to kind of minimize the generation of particles is is what FDA kind of emphasizes in this uh, guidance document um, and then also you know manufacturers should conduct studies to determine whether their manufacturing process generates particles so the, again that goes back to you know being proactive and preventative to uh, control uh, particles, you know, early on in the manufacturing process. So, um, so you know, when you're looking at it from a process development perspective, you know, making sure, you know, identifying these areas where particles may be generating and trying to come up with strategies to minimize those particles is something that uh, FDA will, will probably be, you know, expecting. Um, instead of being reactive when those particles are, are being found during commercialization. Um, so intrinsic particles could also be related to the formulation or stability of the product and its container closure. So, you know, we're talking about particles being formed from precipitation of API, uh, glass delamination or protein silicone, you know, oil interaction. So these are kind of things that you know, our product contact surfaces that may cause the formation of, of particles. Um, so, you know, manufacturers should study the risks associated with these intrinsic particles um, under accelerated stress conditions and any any time dependent particulate formation or growth that can occur. So, um, so get you know, kind of going, you know, the you know looking at it from that risk perspective again i'm you know we're talking about inherent lowest risk intrinsic and then extrinsic being highest risk um, you know it's important to know that like um, you know going back to inherent um, particles i mean they're not just always uh, no risk right so you can have you know protein protein interactions that may affect the potency of the product um, and, and that, that's that's why it's important to have some controls in place to to monitor and and, and the acceptance criteria for the amount and uh, the size of these uh, these particles being generated. Um, but but on a, on a risk perspective, extrinsics probably the highest risk here. Um, so again, in, intrinsic particles are kind of considered medium risk. Extrinsic particles, um, I talked about this earlier. Uh, you know. They come from sources outside the formulation components, the containers, enclosures, or the manufacturing product contact services. So it's really important to, uh, uh, you know, highlight product contact services. So anything that's not a product contact services would be considered extrinsic particles. Um, you know, and it's important. You know, extrinsic particles can negatively affect the product quality and, and could indicate possible microbial contamination or other uh gmp issue um you know extrinsic particles are also evidence of poor conditions in the manufacturing facility so if you have you know equipment that might be uh you know if there's like metal shavings or something like that in the product you know that may be that may indicate that there's um that there's some preventative maintenance issues or something you know equipment might, might need repair or you know there's um Generally, whenever you have extrinsic particles, it's something that should be of, of highest priority to identify the source and correct it. And again, uh, FDA views, um, you know, extrinsic particles as being the highest risk. 
you know. So again, I, I think just looking at particles, you know, think product contact surfaces is is intrinsic. Things that are not product contact surfaces are extrinsic, you know, and, and the, the this FDA guidance, you know, more narrowly defines that, you know, further than that PDA, uh, the PDA document. They have similar terms that are used in both of them, but just that this one just provides a little bit more clarity on on what's considered uh, intrinsic and extrinsic particles. Um, it's important to note that, you know, Chris talked about this a little bit earlier, quality cannot be tested into a product or the visual inspection program. Um, so meaning, you know, you, you can't rely on your visual inspection program to kind of call out or remove vials that um, have particles in them and, and consider that kind of an in-process control. You know, that, that should be controlled. Um, you know, early on during the product development stage, and then, you know, putting in strategies to kind of minimize the presence of particles in there instead of uh, relying on your visual inspection program to kind of remove those after the manufacturing process. So that's um, so th that's that's something that that the FDA would, you know, frowns upon, you know, removing things that, uh, you know, vials that are may have particles on that to justify you know, a poorly designed um, manufacturing process. Uh, again, the, the idea is to be more preventative. Um, and then also, you know, you also have to think about, you know, the level of detection, you know, so people that are performing the visual inspection, you know, um, it's not always going to be 100%. So, you know, trying to be upfront and, and remove those particles, part of the manufacturing process is, is important than relying on downstream processes to remove those uh, later on because you know sometimes those vials might um, go undetected by the visual inspection process so that's why it's important to control it during uh, manufacturing um, again uh, you know this should start with the development phase and continue during scale up process qualification and commercial manufacturing so during all of those stages um, you know, you should be looking at areas where particles might be generated and, and kind of uh, create some corrective actions to, um, to to minimize the presence of these uh, particles. Um, you know, and visual inspection can be viewed as a larger program to ensure that injectable products are essentially free of visible particles. Um, but you know, you shouldn't rely solely on visual inspection to uh, detect and, and remove and, and call out, you know, vials that uh, have uh, particulates in it. Um, so the FDA guidance also talks about, you know, the establishment of visual inspection program. So there should be procedures for inspecting the product. Uh, there should be a statistical sampling plan, should be acceptance and rejection criteria, procedures for evaluating uh, inspection results. Um, the visual inspection program should be product specific. So, um, you know, sometimes I, I'll see, you know, one visual inspection program for, you know, a company that would manufacture lyophilized product and uh, liquid product and, uh, you know, something that would have amber vials, but there's only one visual inspection program in, in the, for, for the, the manual inspection it will only cover like the qualification of maybe uh, clear vials with the liquid, but then the lyophilized product and the ones that have amber vials are kind of excluded with from the scope of the visual inspection program. So again, it's the visual inspection program should be product specific. Um, also, when you're talking about generating libraries for these products, you know, because each uh, manufacturing process is, is kind of unique you know, you, the libraries are going to be unique to that product as well. So that's why, um, you know, the visual inspection program should be product specific. Um, the formal risk assessments, you know, should be conducted during product development, should be used to establish um, product specific production controls and in process alert and action limits for particulates. So, you know, trending the amount of particulates um, 
during visual inspection, you know, and, and establishing alert and action limits for those is is, is important. Um, you know, and you should have some threshold studies to uh, to determine the characteristics of like the size, shape, and color of visible visible particulates, um, and they should be um, included in your um, manual visual inspection uh, qualification kit. So, so to demonstrate that they are uh, detected by trained personnel that are performing manual inspection. Um, And then um, just establishing a visual inspection program, um, you know, it should be performed by trained and qualified personnel. Uh, there's no requirement that these individuals are from the quality unit, but they should be properly trained. Um, oftentimes that includes, you know, some type of eye exam and then also making sure that the individuals are trained on um, the current particles that may be present. So, so for example, um, you know, as particles get identified during um, during the visual inspection program, it's important to include those particles onto the qualification kit that's being used for manual inspection. So when the operators are, uh, with the people that are performing manual visual inspection are, are trained and uh, qualified to detect those type of particles. So it's kind of like, it's a more, I would say it's more of like a dynamic uh, kit. So, you know, as particles are found, they should be added to this qualification kit and the manual inspection process should be, um, you know, they should be challenged on those new particles that are being identified. Um, you know, AQL testing should be performed, um, uh, quality assurance, you know, it should be done through a life cycle approach. Um, the the FDA guidance also talks about uh, the use of manual, semi-automated, or automated visual inspection uh, may be used for 100% inspection. Um, but either way, like whatever method you're using, whether it's manual, semi-automated, or auto automated, um, you know, it should be properly qualified, especially for the uh, automated visual inspection. Um, and oftentimes that's done through like a, a NAP test. So you, you're evaluating um, whether the automated process is, is superior to uh, manual um, processes. So, you know, companies that manufacture large batches, so if, let's say if you're manufacturing a product that has a million vials in each batch, uh, you know, manual, manual visual inspection of that product is going to take, you know, a, a very long time to complete. So I think companies that uh, produce large batches, you know, an automated visual inspection program may be um, more more preferable than than something like a manual inspection, just because the process just takes a very long time to do. But either either way, you know, you should there should be some type of study or um, to determine the, the the level of detection for these automated pieces of equipment. So oftentimes you'll have you'll compare the detection levels for manual inspection and the ones for automated inspection and figure out which one is kind of superior. And based on that, you can kind of um, determine the, 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 the proper um, uh, way for performing visual inspection. But either way, you know, the visual inspection process should be free from distractions and other light, um, strenuous light. So if you're having your visual inspection process being performed in a, in a very loud uh, um, manufacturing environment with a lot of, uh, you know, environmental light, you know, that, that might affect the ability for the people performing manual inspection to uh, detect these particles. So it's important to kind of minimize distractions and extraneous light. So a lot of, oftentimes you'll see uh, people put, you know, in a really dark room that have really in, intense light where they can kind of make sure that they're paying attention to, to identify these particles. Um, and then also making sure that people have breaks too. So, you know, if people that are performing this manual inspection process, you know, making sure that they have periodic breaks where, um, 
you, you know, where they, they can take a break from 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 looking at the files and then coming back to it. Um, and again, this this goes back to the the level of detection and making sure that people are able to detect these uh, these particles in the product. Um, you know, the, from manual and semi-automated inspections, it should be ergonomically designed for inspector cuffers. Um, again, that that includes having appropriate breaks at uh, designated times. Um, for semi-automated and automated equipment, it should be routinely calibrated, inspected, and checked according to a written program to ensure proper performance. So it's like any other piece of equipment. You know, making sure that it's qualified and um, you know, it's, it's being calibrated, it's being, um, you know, making sure that, you know, anytime you have any type of automated equipment that it's, um, that's properly installed and qualified. Um, but it also, you know, this guidance document also encourages companies to use uh, automated inspection technology uh, in lieu of, of manual inspection. So I, I don't, sometimes there's a, um, I, I don't want to say that automated inspection technology is always superior to manual inspection, but you know, having said that, I mean, I, I think it's a lot more efficient, especially if you have large batch sizes to use some type of automated process, uh, because you, you don't want your manual inspection process, manual visual inspection process to take several days or even a few weeks to complete for the very large batches. So it makes a lot of sense if you're making large batch sizes to use some type of automated inspection technology and making sure that it's properly qualified and challenged against uh, um, detection levels against uh, manual visual inspection. Um, so when establishing visual inspection process, they should conduct um, feasibility studies for visible, for detectability, um, illumination and for uh, fatigue time frame. So again, you know, measuring the lux of the light source, uh, you know, making sure that there's, uh, you know, that people aren't doing visual inspection for eight hours straight, but that there's breaks in between. So to account for fatigue and stuff like that. So, and all of those should be challenged as part of the qualification of the manual visual inspection. Um, you know, statistical methodology should be used and, and should have um, written procedures established for conducting visual inspection. Um, so the written procedures should cover each aspect of the visual inspection process, including handling of units, maximum length of the inspection period. So how long can people do the inspection without uh, taking a break? Uh, also disposition and documentation of rejection rejected units and batches, um, you know, just, just an overall, the, the procedures should be very, um, very clear on conducting the 100% inspection. Um, and also, you know, you, you should develop appropriate process for hard to inspect products. So, you know, things that are in amber vials or lyophilized product or because, um, because I mean, particles are very, especially if it's like a white particle, it's very hard to detect in, in a lyophilized, a white lyophilized product. So, um, th there's other uh, alternative um, techniques that could be used to detect the presence of these particles. You know, and as I, I made reference earlier to like uh, using X-ray technology for detection of uh, particles and things like that. So that, so the FDA encourages that. The use of these, uh, you know, alternative technologies to kind of uh, enhance the ability for uh, detection of particles. Um, I talked about this a little bit earlier, you know, regarding, you know, following 100% inspection, they should employ statistical sound sampling plans. Um, inspection methods should be validated and you should have acceptance criteria to ensure that it's uh, meets a proper uh, pre-established AQL for particular contamination. So it's important to note that like, you know, the, the concepts talked about in this FDA guidance are consistent with the USP general chapters. You know, Chris was talking about earlier, the USP uh, section one and 790 talk about particles uh, in the product. 
but it goes, but this this kind of guidance kind of goes further in talking about sampling plans and acceptance criteria, uh, and and it also talks about um, um, you you know just looking at it more from a risk perspective, um, you know, and then we're we're talking about sampling plan the um, the guidance also references the ASTM E2234 um, uh, is, is a good is a good option for for looking at the sampling plans. Um, again, you know, looking at you know a large portion of this document is talking about the visual inspection program. Um, so you know, talking about you know, it, talk, it talks about having certified inspectors. Uh, in, inspect the product. I talked about this earlier, some of the things, you know, having a qualification kit and making sure that, that qualification kit is is updated with the current part uh, particulates that may be present in the product and, and making sure that you update that that kit. Um, you know, pe making sure that people are adequately trained uh, in a periodic retraining. And again, you know, updating those kits as, as you find, um, new particles. So one, one of the questions I used to ask is, you know, like, you know, I'd look at a particle investigation and then I'd ask, okay, you found a new particle. Was that included in the, in, in the qualification kit for people to detect that particle during visual inspection? And so some companies do that, but some companies, you know, don't do that. So it's important to kind of update that um, qualification kit as, as new particles are kind of identified. Um, to make sure that the, the operators that are performing the activity are able to detect it. Um, you know, in a mixture of good units and defective units should be used for inspector qualification. Um, and the test kit should be approved by the QA staff. Um, you know, equipment that's being used for uh, inspections must be out adequately validated. So that that's the you know, regarding semi-automated and automated equipment, making sure that that's properly qualified and validated. Um, you know, and this, you know, just making sure that um, there's you know, adequate controls in place for um, performing the visual inspection. I talked about this a little bit as, you know, making sure that, you know, uh, libraries of defective units are collected throughout the product life cycle. So, and again, like if you're, um, if you find a new a particle, you know, making sure that that's included into the uh, library of, of, of defects, um, you know, and QA should be reviewing the, the library of defects on a, on a periodic basis, oftentimes, um, at least annually, but, you know, again, as, as these New particles may be identified, you know, including those into the the library. <clears throat> um, and then the visual inspection library should include examples from the lower limits of detection for visual inspection um, through appropriate threshold studies. So, for example, like if we're talking about, uh, let's say, a, a white particle that's um, maybe 200 microns in size. And then using that example, but then the, the 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 library may have an example of something that might be uh, 500 uh, microns or something. You know, so so you always want to include things in the defect library that are representative of worst case, right? Um, you know, and that that could include you know both number of particles and size of particles and things like that. So it should it should be representative, but it also should be representative of worst case because again we're, we're trying to determine the level of detection for these people to detect the presence of these particles um you know and, and like I, I i was saying earlier you know if a new part of particular matter is identified it should be analyzed determine its source the risk associated with that particle and then also it should be added to the training library um you know, if product quality monitoring systems should provide information uh, to ensure process control. 
uh, throughout the product life cycle. So, um, you know, you should be looking at um, deviations and process defect results, uh, statistical process controls, equipment breakdowns, and things like that to establish kind of a what, what is the overall state of control in the manufacturing process to control for particles. Like I was talking about earlier, you know, equipment breakdowns and, and you know, if you, especially if you're seeing like uh, metal shards or something like that in your files, you know, that that's usually indicates some type of issue with, uh, with equipment uh, uh, maintenance and repair and things like that. So, so th those are also things to kind of consider when you're looking at um, uh, your particulate control strategy. Um, you know, and you got, you also look at your product quality indicators. So looking at your stability test results, complaints, return product, um, and then, you, you know, and then also, you know, especially with complaints and seeing if that, you know, the presence of any particles may have been generated at the facility and, and taking that, um, into consideration during the investigation of these complaints. Um, as I think Chris referenced uh, a, a warning letter that was issued regarding complaints regarding particulate matters that weren't uh, thoroughly investigated. So that's that kind of goes to that. So making sure that you know you're being more holistic when your approach towards uh, uh, conducting these investigations um, to identify the source and, um, and taking action to uh, to mitigate or reduce the risk of particles in your product. Um, you know, field alert reports and adverse event reports, they, they may also reveal possible particulate related quality issues. So, you know, that should also kind of feed into this um, visual inspection lifecycle approach. Um, and then you, you should periodically evaluate the effectiveness of the visual uh, particle control program to see if there's any type of improvements that may be made to the to the process and and reduction of particles being generated in the um, in the manufacturing process. Okay, um, you know it, it should be you know visual the the part, uh, particles should be trended. Identification of new particles should be uh, should be a high priority uh, investigation. Um, particles that exceed alert or action limits may indicate a flaw in the product or process design. So those should also be investigated. Um, if an investigation reveals a flaw in the product or process design, it's important to redesign the product or process um, to reduction of particulate matter. So I can give you one example. Um, you know, th there was you know, of, of a company that had a lot of particles being generated and and one of the the design of the manufacturing process was that they had a lot of people in the aseptic area and so and, and that was kind of like a known uh, issue that you know generation of particles because there's a lot of people is more, it was more of like a manual filling process and that was kind of causing a lot of these particles being generated but um, but instead, you know, in, instead of kind of looking at the design of how the aseptic area was kind of um, created, you know, um, you know, they, they just, it just kind of it was kind of an ongoing issue where they had particles that kept on being generated instead of like looking at the process itself to kind of see, you know, is there any way that we can kind of remove some of these people from the filling operation or is there any way that we can, um, you know, look at it more from a corrective action to prevent the uh, the generation of particles with all these people, you know? So, so you have to kind of look at look at it kind of holistically to see, you know, is, is there anything going forward what we can do as far as you know changing the manufacturing process or the number of people or um, or the equipment, you know, things like that. Um, to, to reduce the amount of particles. So again, you should have like a short term, medium term and a long term strategy to con to um, to reduce the amount of particles. So so that kind of goes into uh, that that um, that that category. Um, so 
you know, the, the, the guidance reflects the FDA's current thinking on visible uh, particle control. So, so these, are, these are kind of the key takeaways for manufacturers for this. So, you know, it, it, it aligns with the approach FDA investigators have been using to inspect uh, sterile drug manufacturers and, and using a risk-based approach to, to strengthen particulate matter control programs. Um, and so, you know, the FDA investigators are likely to apply the principles in this guidance document, um, you know, as, as more inspections kind of resume through COVID. Um, so, you know, it's important to be kind of aware of these key concepts in this uh, new FDA guidance and, and kind of look at your own particulate matter control programs and see if there's any room for improvement or um, see if there's any type of Make make sure that your uh, visual inspection program is aligned with the guidance, um, and then so it's important that the, you know to note that this new FDA guidance you know is similar in a lot of respects to the PDA technical report on part uh, particulates, but there are some important clarifications. I think the main clarifications are you know talking about a more life cycle approach towards it, you know identifying these particles early on and in the development phase. And then also it provides some clarity on um, what's defined as an intrinsic particle and an extrinsic particle. And then, you know, the guidance also talks a lot about uh, the visual inspection program and, and encourages, um, uh, you know, companies to adopt more automated visual inspection technologies. Um, but it's important to note that, like, if you're using automated visual inspection technologies, that you have some type of uh, data to support that it's superior or equal to uh, manual inspection. Oftentimes it is, but, like, you know, it's important to have that data available. Um, and then, you know, there's also emphasis on development stage risk assessments. Um, you know, at, that, at this stage, you know, you're going to have limited understanding of the process, but it's important to kind of predict. Uh, what types of particles may be generated in the process. And again, I was talking about earlier, you may start to see some more um, questions regarding particulate generation during um, <clears throat> during the review cycle um, for applications. Um, you know, and, and the visual particle control program are kind of like living, living documents. So as more particles are being identified and, and found, you know, these, uh, you know, it, it should be updated. Um, so it's not just, we have one qualification kit, we have one library and it's static, you know? So you wanna make sure that that's more of a dynamic process uh, that, that's, that's consistent with your current, uh, the current particles that are being generated in the, in the manufacturing process. Um, so that's, that's it from, from, from Chris and I. Um, it was a real pleasure um, you know, speaking to you today regarding uh, visual inspection programs. So hopefully, you know, you gain some valuable uh, information regarding uh, the FDA's new, uh, new guidance document on visual inspection. So I'll go ahead and uh, hand it off to uh, Chris and Uday. So Chris, I'll, I'll make you the organizer so that you can read the questions and both of you can take the Q&As. So here, Chris, I'm making you the organizer. You'll be able to see the questions tab. It will be there in your control panel. Yep, I see them now. Yeah. All right. So Dan, the first question is, um, Please provide a few examples of extrinsic particles, and I think you, I think you did that in the course of the of the presentation. But maybe you can just kind of reiterate a few of the types of examples of extrinsic particles that you've seen during your time as a, a BA investigator. Yeah. Um, so extrinsic particles, you know, I, you know, it could be metal shards. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, paint chips could be another one. It could be like some type. I, I've seen feathers. <laughs> Um, I, I, let's see, you know, anything that's not 
contained within the product contact surfaces is, is something that would be defined as extrinsic. Um, So another another question, Dan, was around um, the requirement to to measure potentially measure um, visible particles as part of the investigation. Um, so you know, in, in your view, is it necessary to to measure visible particles upon identification, and and what, how can that be used for for the investigation purposes and risk assessment? Yeah. So you know, going back to the risk profile or you know, risk classification for the um, for the particles, especially like when you're looking at the clinical risk of it, you know, the size and shape of, of the particle is important to consider in, in that. So um, I, I've seen in a lot of particle investigations where um, I don't I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of uh, third party laboratories that, that kind of specialize in in identification of of these particles. So a lot of times companies will send this, send the particle out for identification, and that oftentimes includes, um, you know, what, um, you know, there's some type of like spectra analysis to kind of determine what what the, the particle is, and it also includes the size, shape, evaluation. Um, so all of those things are kind of factored into the overall risk assessment for it. So you can think of uh, injectable products if if there's if the size is is large and and the shape is more jagged you know the clinical risk of that particle is 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 higher than than if that particle is is more round shape or smaller in shape another question dan is around um the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic particles and and relating to you know, one of the one of the questions was, what about particles that come from the clean room environment? How would those be classified as intrinsic or extrinsic under the guidance document, given they're not coming from direct product contact surfaces? Yeah, so th those would be coming from the environment. So those would be e extrinsic particles. Yeah, and, and yeah. again, it, we're we're talking extrinsic particles are more of a higher risk because the microbial. Uh, there's a lot more of unknowns, you know, there's a lot more knowns regarding, you know, interaction of the product um, and the particle for, for product contact surfaces is something that's known. But, you know, when you're talking about extrinsic particles, you know, is, is there any type of like leaching or is there any type of like interaction between that particle and the formulation itself? And then also like from a microbial perspective, you know, there, the you know there's a lot more unknowns with extrinsic particles than um, things that are that are intrinsic so th the risk profile is a lot higher yeah and related to that question there was a question around you know particles that are easily identifiable such as metal shavings um and why are they why are they high risk even though they have a high rate of detectability Right. So it, again, that's it, it goes back to um, you know the metal shavings is, is indicates you know some oftentimes it's, it's some issue with the equipment. So you know looking back at your preventive maintenance and repairs and things like that, it's really important to identify you know the source of these things and make sure that it's not. Um, you know, being used, I mean, not being introduced to, to more um, batches that are manufactured. So if you if you know that there's an issue with metal shavings being generated at a certain manufacturing process, then, you know, the expectation is that you identify that source of that, those, those, that issue and, and address it before manufacturing the next batch. Like it's not acceptable to kind of say, well, we know, that this um, these metal shavings are being generated at this per, at, at this this stage of manufacturing, um, and we know we need to do repairs on it, but we're going to still continue to manufacture batches. You know that's probably not a a good strategy to have. So, um, you know, even though the level of detection might be um, 
higher, you know, with metal shavings, the, the risk profile there, you know, being that it's extrinsic um, is, is still considered high. Yeah, and I, and I would also add that, you know, for, for many extrinsic particles, the reason that they're high risk is, is because they are potential sterility assurance concerns. Um, they they are impacting the potential you know integrity of the closed system that's required to assure sterility of the finished product, and so it's not just the nature of the particle itself; it's the fact that it also calls into question the sterility assurance controls that are in place. Um, and and then the last question I think that we've got probably time for today, um, and this is one that that comes up several times, several different ways, is around the establishment of of control or acceptance criteria um, by way of you know, alert and action limits for the different categories of particles. And what, you know, what in your view, Dan, have you seen be successful? Um, and, and what do you think is the, the expectation under, under FDA's December 2021 guidance document? Yeah, so, so setting up acceptance criteria based on, um, you know, uh, I, I've seen companies do, set limits based on critical major and, and minor, you know, defects and things like that. And, you know, but it's important to kind of trend those over time and then establish limits, uh, acceptable limits for the, each of those categories. So anytime those are exceeded, um, then, then investigation should be conducted. Um, and I, Chris, you've, you've probably seen this too. So I welcome your thoughts on this well. Yeah, no, I, I agree, Dan. I think, you know, really those acceptance criteria to your point are are established over time as you generate data about your product and about the particles that you see in your product. You know, I think the guidance document clarifies that FDA's expectation is that you have those developed in the, you know, that you have initial criteria set at the product development stage as you as you bring your product through through qualification and validation and then you continue to hone those limits or you know tighten those limits as you learn more about the product once it's once it's commercial and you're you're kind of manufacturing at a higher scale um, so those are you know product specific and in many instances facility specific um, because they relate to you know your product your process your equipment um, and, and, and are kind of specifically what you, the data that you generate um, for, for your purposes. So, so I think that, I think Uday probably closes out, you know, the time we have today. I know there's a, a, several questions, but I think I tried to get to the main themes. Um, but, um, you know, hopefully the, the folks um, on, that were able to participate today found this, found this useful. So thank you again. Oh, I think you're muted, Uday. Uh, sorry, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Daniel, for an excellent presentation. And uh, just before we conclude, I will let you have your concluding remarks, both of you. And with that, we will uh, close this webinar. Okay. Yeah, it was just a real pleasure, uh, you know, speaking with all of you today. So, so thank you for the time and opportunity, and um, and um, hope to do this again sometime. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just like to echo. Dan's, Dan's thanks. Um, thank you all again for taking the time today. This is a, you know, incredibly important topic, um, you know, particularly for, for Indian manufacturers where a number of the, many of the injectable products distributed and used in the United, United States are, are manufactured in India. Um, so certainly as we see FDA um, scaling up its inspection operations, once again, this will definitely be a focus. Um, so please, you know, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. You know, happy to happy to answer email or or whatever. Um, but but thank you again for for taking the time today um, to discuss this important topic. So thank you, thank you, Dan, thank you, Chris, thank you, delegates, for joining here today in such large numbers. Please do join us on April 26 at 4 p.m. for a webinar on risk-based approach in computer system validation. With this, we are closing this webinar. Thank you, goodbye, and have a good evening. Thank you.